Spainar, I'm director of the Center on Global Economic Governance, which is very pleased to host as part of uh, CIPA, Alec Ross, who is a senior fellow here at CIPA in international affairs and uh, is one of the foremost experts on innovation, which is uh, the title of today's talk. And a lot of us are obviously working in that area, interested because it's the driving force. Uh, I should say that uh, Alec has a book forthcoming with Simon and Schuster about industries and businesses of the future. So uh, those of you who are interested in that, uh, it's coming up soon. He serves as advisor to corporations, various institutions uh, on issues relating to geopolitics, markets, and disruptive network uh, technologies. He had a four-year stint at the State Department as special advisor to Hillary uh, Clinton. Uh, his task was to maximize the potential of technology uh, and innovation in service of America's diplomatic goal. And he was stewarding the uh, Secretaries of State 21st uh, Century Statescraft agenda. He's worked in a number of uh, areas while he was at the State Department, managing institutional cultural change. Uh, he was uh, directing the Internet uh, Freedom Agenda, which was a hundred million dollar in funds for cutting edge projects. He was um, conceiving the system of public diplomacy relying on social media and working in diversity and innovation in the foreign service. He's been uh, uh, awarded a number of distinguished awards. He's top 100 global thinkers uh, by Foreign Policy Magazine received the U.S. Department of State Distinguished Honor Award, Huffington Post, 10 Game Changers in Politics, and many others. Uh, this is his second in a series of uh, three lectures. There is one more coming with Anya Schifrin later this uh, term, so stay tuned and uh, participate in both this one and the next one. The uh, plan of action is, uh, Alec will start by introducing the subject, then he and I will engage in little friendly back and forth uh, for your entertainment, and then it's all up to you, and you'll be uh, asking questions and answering and everything else. All right? Alec, the floor is yours. Welcome. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Spanner, you read that introduction just like my mother wrote it. That's right. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's terrific. So look, what I want to do, not for very long, because I find that the interaction, the discussion, particularly in settings like this one, can be far much more interesting than a monologue, is I'm going to speak just for about 15, 20 minutes, uh, giving a bit of a tour to horizon of four fields that exist and are important today, but which I project are going to grow far larger and be quite disruptive for both good and ill over the next decade. And just be, you know, do sort of the slightest scratch at the surface of each of these four very large industry segments and use them as the basis for discussion. Uh, the first is robotics. If I were to summarize my thinking about robotics in one sentence, it's this. The robots of the cartoons and movies of the 1970s are going to be the reality of the 2020s. Uh, it's really remarkable the degree to which what's happening in robotics right now is, gonna, is going to inform a tomorrow that is largely unrecognizable today in terms of mechanization and in terms of some of the impacts on uh, our workforce. Now, uh, the presumption to this point is that what robotics would previously do is, is replace unskilled labor, you know, unskilled manual labor. And certainly that has been a significant amount of the workforce that it has displaced. But a more nuanced analysis about what its actual impact has been and what its impact over the next 10 years is going to be, I think has come from a couple of professors at MIT, one of whom I believe will be here at SIPA uh, within the next few weeks, Darren Asimoglu. Darren Asimoglu and David Autour, I think, have brought far more nuance to understanding what robotics impact on our workforce is going to be by, by making a couple distinctions in terms of sort of the workflows that they believe will be displaced. And the distinction they've made is, is cognitive versus manual 
and routine versus non-routine. So I think that the presumption has been is that what robots will do is that which is manual as opposed to cognitive and routine as opposed to non-routine. And, and that's certainly been the case, but what's interesting is we are increasingly seeing robots uh, also playing the role of being able to do work that is cognitive so long as it is routine. The processing power now available with relatively low capital expenditures is allowing for mechanization of jobs that previously would have had some level of cognition, uh, but would but you know but would have um, had nothing that would have lent itself to not being mechanized. So the, the best example of this can be if you just look, for example, at air travel. So you wouldn't have thought necessarily that booking an airline ticket is, manu is, is um, something that a robot could do. Why? Because you, know, you aren't going to just punch a button that says, oh, well, I want to go to Milan. There's nuance in terms of the kinds of bookings that you want to do. But the automation of the role of the travel agent has been near total. Further, when you go to uh, the airport today, by and large, the people who would have once taken your ticket have now largely been replaced by, by um, little mechanical stalls. What we're seeing is that being essentially chapter one, page one, towards automation that requires cognition, but that nevertheless is largely routinized. And I think that what this means is that what we're going to see is increasingly higher, le higher levels in the stack of the kinds of jobs that can be replaced by automation and by robotics being replaced. Now, it's, it's interesting to see where some of the development of these technologies are coming from. While the United States continues to be a leader in robotics, far more emphasis is being placed on this in East Asia than in the United States. And I think the best, one, one of the more interesting explanations for this actually is cultural. Uh, in Western cultural, culture, if we we're able to, if we we're able to create such a monolith, uh, there are these inherent prejudices against uh, robotics. There are these, we, you know, we are taught you know, from our mythology, modern and ancient, uh, that beasts that we create that have human traits are scary things. Frankenstein, for example. They are believed to be soulless, inherently soulless. But what's interesting is that in Eastern cultures and sort of across the panoply of, of Eastern religions, these biases are not in place. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing robots and robotics accepted in the workplace and accepted in societies in ways that would grate here in the United States. And what we therefore are seeing is a level of R&D taking place in robotics in East Asia that I think is far outstripping what's taking place in the United States. So while we in the U.S. have thought of ourselves as sort of the great innovators of the past quarter century, and while I think that that assertion is largely justified, and while there does continue to be very interesting development in R&D and robotics in the United States, I think that there's going to be a, a quite, I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of, of indigenous innovation that comes out of Korea, that comes out of Japan, that comes out of China, which I think is going to grow global shortly thereafter. And again, to go back to my prediction from the outset, I think that the robots of the cartoons and movies of the 1970s are going to be the reality of the 2020s. Second industry that I think is going to be incredibly different five years ago from present day is in genomics. Humans have between 20 and 25,000 genes. And if you look at some of the changes in terms of the ability of the individual to get information, to get data, and for that data then be harnessed for one's own health care, it's a fundamentally different world today than it was even three years ago. In three, three years ago, Steve Jobs was one of 100 people uh, to pay $100,000 uh, 
to have their DNA sequenced. So he pay, Steve paid $100,000 to have his DNA sequenced and to have his tumor mapped. And basically what he got was a lot of raw data with which his care providers really couldn't do anything. Fast forward just three years. Three years is not a very long time. Today, the same thing that Steve Jobs had done for $100,000, with which his doctors could have done very little, now costs about $4,000. And the, and the tools that physicians have to be able to do something intelligently to respond to the data drawn from the genomics is far greater. This has happened in three years. And what's interesting to me, you know, I think that outcomes are oftentimes largely predicted by the outflows of capital. So something will happen if there's a lot of money going towards it. And what's interesting is we've finally gotten to the point now where this is viewed as an investment-worthy space by the private sector. It's not just public sector dollars funding basic research, but the bloodthirsty capitalists inside the pharmaceutical companies finally feel like they are within range of being able to make money on this. And so what this has done is it has brought the level of capitalization and risk capital to this field, uh, which I think is going to significantly accelerate uh, commercialization in this space. And interestingly, uh, I think that a lot of the commercialization here, too, is going to be, a non, is going to be non-American. Uh, I think that it oftentimes will be, be from companies that are incorporated in the, in the United States, but all they actually have in the U.S. is a C Corp. Uh, interestingly, I see increasingly the scientific and commercial teams that are being built around genomics as being entirely distributed. There will be a team in Paris. There will be a team in Haifa. There will be a team in Cape Town. There will be a team in Sao Paulo. There will be a team at Stanford and a team at Johns Hopkins. And they'll all be working collaboratively. And then some funding entity will have to determine how, how it's easiest and best for them to commercialize their product. And what I'm beginning to see is that the firm formation is taking place in the United States. And any of the therapy trials are going to take place, more likely than not, outside the United States in Switzerland or in other places where uh, it's easier to bring something to market than through the FDA. So one of the things that's very interesting to me to see is to see the globally distributed nature of entrepreneurship in the genomics space. Now, having said that, I do think that a lot of that which is most advanced and a lot of that which is most interesting is actually domiciled within American universities. And they oftentimes are, frankly, not American professors, but they oftentimes are American institutions within which these scientists from all four corners of the world are working. Uh, one last point I'll make on the commercialization of genomics is that I think it's going to overwhelmingly benefit uh, the wealthy before it benefits everyday people. Um, in the same way in which Steve Jobs three years ago was in a relatively privileged position to be able to write a big check and get his tumor mapped. Uh, I think that the way in which our healthcare financing systems work and the way in which basically the capex that's necessary to go into funding sort of individual courses of care that involve genomics at all, I think that it's, it's likeliest that for the next five, six, seven years at a minimum for genomics to be applied science within the health and well-being uh, of people, it's largely going to be rooted in people who are particularly wealthy, because what they're able to do is they're able to self-fund such things outside of um, uh, their insurance, their health insurance systems and other such things. I also see that the, the kind of personalization um, that is necessary within this, within the sort of product building around this is high cost, high intensity, and again, is therefore going to skew towards the very wealthy. Um, one of the first examples of trying to bring genomics to the masses uh, is in a lot of trouble right now, and I think justifiably so. There's a company that some of you may know called 23andMe, uh, which was started by an entrepreneur named Ann Wojcicki. 
And what they tried to do was say, well, we are not going to give you very, very, we are not going to give you the most precise kind of genetic information that will give you, if not omniscience, the near certainty about uh, what your genetic makeup lends itself or does not lend itself to. But what we're going to be able to do is for a relatively low cost, I think it was like $99 or $199 or something like this, we'll be able to do a very basic analysis of your genetic makeup and we'll be able to give you sort of very large categories of, you know, what you're, what you are at risk for. And the FDA shut down uh, their ability to do anything that's, you know, came anywhere close to diagnostic. And I, and I think that with the benefit of some retrospection, it created more, more panic than precision. So this is the one example I know of where an attempt was made to bring sort of genetic information for personal health care to the masses, and it didn't get off to a very good start. The third of the four fields that I'll point to as being particularly interesting for the years ahead are cryptocurrencies, uh, the best known of which is, is Bitcoin. Nothing says state sovereignty like our banknotes. You know, in the U.S., we put pictures of our presidents on ours. In Europe, they put pictures of their prime ministers, their kings and their queens on theirs. Uh, one of the interest, more interesting developments of the past 18 months, in my opinion, has been this move, this conversion of currency to code. And I think that this has really been faci facilitated by two things. First, one technological and one macroeconomic. Uh, technologically, uh, the one thing that I think is particularly noteworthy uh, with Bitcoin specifically is there's the solution that they have come up to uh, to what's known as the Byzantine generals problem. The Byzantine general problem, in essence, is how can you ensure that code can't be, can't be counterfeited? If code is just a series of zeros and ones, and if a digital currency is made up of nothing more than code, then how can you tell if something is authentic or if something is simply a hack? How can you tell if something is simply counterfeited? And so what this very interesting innovation in the cryptocurrency space is, is it's basically saying, well, instead of just printing dollar bills, our currency system is really going to function largely like a ledger, something that purports to be completely transparent. And what one might call currency or something of stored value is really nothing more than a seat in the ledger. And transactions that take place in this space are all open to public view. It's all open source. It's all, it's supposed to be hyper transparent and therefore invulnerable to counterfeiting or to outside manipulation. Now, I think the reality of this has been far different to this point than the theory, though I do think that the computer science behind it has been particularly elegant. So there's been progress, I believe, in the last few years, technologically speaking, to enable a real electronic currency to be something possible and viable in the market in a way that wasn't possible five years ago. Um, I don't think we're there yet. I think that Bit I think of Bitcoin like one of these search engines from the 1990s. You know, Lycos, Infoseek, Webcrawler, AltaVista, Excite. Do you guys remember those? Any of you use them? Um, some of the younger students are like, what? <laughs> I was born in the 90s, but that's it, no. So I, th I think that there are, you know, maybe I'm being overly critical, but I think that there have been a number of flaws that have been brought out in Bitcoin. But what I think has been demonstrated is the technological possibility of a cryptocurrency. And the second thing that I think is very important that has been de demonstrated is the demand case. And, and the demand case, I think, can be summed up from today's a1 above the fold headline in the Financial Times. Uh, $70 billion worth of capital flight in the first three months of 2014 just from Russia. If you think about the total, let's call it market cap of Bitcoin, the total market cap of Bitcoin has tended to fluctuate somewhere between four and $10 billion for the most part in the past many months. That is a relatively small percentage of the, t of the desire to facilitate, of the, of the pent up capital flight 
that's trying to escape economies like Russia's, that's trying to escape economies like China's. The amount of gold that is purchased and stored, you know, literally in closets every year in China is now up to $50 billion. $50 billion uh, worth of gold bars are being bought and stored in China, in China every year. And that's largely because people want a hard, non-yuan-based currency that they can convert to. And if they convert to a Western currency, then what they're doing is they are, then they are signaling to their central government what they're doing, and that they and they are then creating problems for themselves. So I think that that you know, looking back at events in Russia, China, and with the financial crisis in Cyprus, I think that you know, if you just get the stuff that falls off the back of the truck, uh, you can see a sufficient economic demand case uh, for a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. I also see there being an increasingly strong move uh, in developing economies to try to be to try to do uh, f- more to try to do electronic purchases with less friction, with you know, with lower transaction costs. For all of the innovation that's taken place in the electronic marketplace of the past twenty years, we still have not been able to get transaction costs on purchases or on currency conversions uh, much below 2% with any consistency. And while that might not sound like a lot, it actually is. And when you're dealing, particularly in low denomination currencies or environments in the developing world, for example, the mandatory minimums that go into transaction costs and other such things basically take vast swaths of the economy off the e-payment grid. So a lot of evangelists for things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency say is we finally come up with a way of making micropayments something efficient uh, or something viable within emerging market marketplaces. Now, I'm skeptical that, that anybody, you know, in the hinterlands of Zambia is going to be is going to be buying a market good anytime soon with some small decimal of a Bitcoin anytime soon. In theory, it could work. Uh, so in the case of cryptocurrencies, I don't know how any of this ends up. But what I do believe is that in the same way in which the search engine was an innovation of the 1990s, uh, that really, that where none of the individual search engines of the, of the mid-90s uh, held firm, the category of search engine did. And similarly, I believe that while it's very questionable whether Bitcoin is the cryptocurrency that endures, I do believe that cryptocurrencies as a category will endure. Now, the the fourth of four things that I wanted to point out um, as an area that I think will produce both an enormous amount of innovation but also an enormous amount of disruption for both good and ill is in many ways the, that which is most obvious and that which has been most written about and discussed, and therefore I'm going to discuss it the least, and that's digitization. And this increasing, the increasing digitization of goods and services around the world is, gonna, is going to continue to create some remarkable stresses in the marketplace. Uh, there's a wonderful book that's recently been written that I would suggest you all read if you haven't, if you're interested in this area. Uh, the Second Machine Age by, by MIT's Andrew McAfee and Eric Brindelson. And there was a story in there that just struck me. Uh, it really took my breath away. There have been 3.5 trillion photos taken place in the history of photography, OK? 3.5 trillion photos have been taken place in the history of photography. 10% of those photos have been, have been taken in the last year. There are now 2.5 billion digital cameras on planet Earth. So we are in a moment where, in human history, photography is stronger and more pervasive than it ever has been in the past. And last year, Kodak went bankrupt. My point in saying this is, is one that's rooted in workforce changes. So interestingly, within a few weeks of each other, a company with a couple dozen employees, Instagram, 
uh, a couple dozen employees where 130 million people used to share billions of face uh, billions of photos was sold to Facebook for a, for a billion dollars. Simultaneous to this, and joined a workforce at Facebook, which has a grand total of 4,600 people. Facebook has 4,600 employees. Simultan nearly simultaneous to this, the company that's most identified historically with photography in the United States, the Eastman Kodak Company, went bankrupt. And at its peak, Kodak employed 145,000 people. So the, the difficulty uh, that has to be navigated here is simultaneous to photography sort of taking off within society and simultaneous to increase in economic output in this space generally, we can see the workforce size necessary to support it continue to decrease. Now, my last points on this, I want to talk for a moment just about geography. And so people, you know, when I was working at the State Department, I traveled 950,000 miles to 41 countries. And they said, all right, Alec, you know, where is all of this innovation going to come from? And I, and, and I genuinely believe that, that innovation in these and other fields will come from all around the world. But what I do believe is that it is going to skew to a couple, couple specific markets. And I think... You know, there's some data that I think tells some interesting stories here. You know, from, there was a recent study done by Telefonica. It was the world's largest global study of millennials. And one very simple question it asked was, how many hours a day do you spend online? And it basically tested the number of hours that millennials spent online. And the data was pretty shocking. North American and, and Latin American millennials spend an average of seven hours a day online. Those in Central and Eastern Europe spend six hours. Those in Asia spend six hours. And those who spend the least amount of time online each day are, are folks in Western Europe, and the Middle East, and Northern Africa. And while I don't think the number of hours you spend plugged in is necessarily correlative to the amount of innovation that is going to be produced, I do think that it's an interesting set of data. What I think is an even more interesting set of data from the same study, which I think is a little bit more frightening uh, for Western Europe, is the answer to the following question. Very simple question. I can be an entrepreneur in my country, yes or no? Americans, relentless optimists that we are, North America, 77% said yes. Asia, 70% said yes. I can be an entrepreneur in my country. Latin America, 69%. The Middle East and North Africa, uh, the Middle East, North Africa, and Africa, 68%. Central and Eastern Europe, 64%. Western Europe, 55%. So what strikes me about this is the degree to which Western Europe is such a negative outlier. Uh, the degree to which if economies are going to continue to be built in some significant measure through new firm formation and through entrepreneurship, then this very simple measure of optimism, of one's belief that one can become an entrepreneur, I think is telling. 40% of America's GDP. 40% of our economy, which is about $6 trillion in annual economic activity, comes from companies that did not exist 35 years ago. 40% of our company comes from companies that didn't exist 35 years ago. I think it's reasonable to believe, and I certainly believe, that if America is going to, be, is going to remain a great economic power, then in 30 years, 35 years, 40% of our economy will have to come from companies that don't exist at, this pre at the present moment. I similarly believe that those states and societies that will compete and succeed most effectively in a world of constant change will be those that create conditions that lend themselves to entrepreneurship. And these data right here, I think, speak to what one could reasonably, where one could reasonably say a lot of this innovation is going to come from. So if you look at that, you, you stay optimistic about North America. You are optimistic about Latin America and Asia. You're 
perhaps a little bit more optimistic than I would have guessed if you were in the, in the Middle East or Africa, you're feeling maybe okay in Central and Eastern Europe, and I bet there's a lot of heterogeneity within Central and Eastern Europe in terms of how they matrix that. And then you're feeling not so good uh, in Western Europe. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll conclude my remarks, Jan, uh, and uh, look forward to opening this up. Great. So provocative and informative it is. Very wonderful, thanks. I'll just ask a couple of questions while you guys are preparing yours. Uh, so one thing that strikes me which is interesting is you mentioned the uh, robotics and its spread beyond the manual and routine to the cognitive uh, routine and et cetera, and the fact that East Asia is putting more and more emphasis on it and that it's essentially a cultural phenomenon. I don't doubt it, I just wonder to what extent there is economics in it as well. Mm -hmm. In particular, let me take the U.S. Uh, example from earlier on. What we've seen, apart from the financial crisis and short-term recession type periods, is that the U.S. has been replacing labor in terms of substituting it, uh, but also growing the economy sufficiently that many new jobs would be created. Right? So the U.S. economy was creating jobs. and. Um, so in some sense, uh, robotics until now and any kind of innovation of this kind was acceptable because it was displacing, but there was always a new opportunity <clears throat> on average, right? And so the assembly line came from the US, much less acceptable in Europe, but it was you know, precursor to robots, right? To what extent is it the fast growing nature of the Asian economies? That's in fact makes it attractive, mm -hmm. as opposed to the historically millennial cultural heritage that you are putting emphasis on. Yeah, so I think you know I I think that there is a, as I said, a cultural and historical connection, but I also think that there are raw economics at place here. And I would simply describe it as the distinction between capex and opex. So human beings, human labor, we are very little capex, and we're a lot of opex. You've got to pay us every two weeks. You have to pay us a wage. Those are essentially OPEX. The real barrier to robotics historically has been CAPEX. Oh, I don't want to buy a, ro a robot because it costs a lot of money. Now, growth that has taken place in the fastest developing economies, most notably China, has increased wages on average, what, 30%? 30% 30%, uh, coastal areas of China. And so what's now happening for the first time is it's now becoming more worth it for a big manufacturer to put out the capex to buy a robot than the opex for some recent emigre from the, the Chinese countryside. And where I was most struck by this was by the most recent labor announcement from Foxconn. Are you all familiar with Foxconn? It's the Taiwanese uh, manufacturer of most of the electronics you have in your purse and in your, in your pockets right now. And Foxconn, its last estimate I saw, it employed 953,000 people. What's interesting about its, last about its last labor announcement is it didn't announce how many people it was going to hire. It announced how many robots it was going to buy. So it announced we are going to hire zero no people, but we're going to buy a million robots. And this is a function not of the, the – you're right to ask this question. That was not a function of a cultural or historical reason. It was a function of the arithmetic uh -huh. done in Taiwan that said, all right, the cost of this labor from the Chinese countryside that has come to the Chinese coast is now sufficiently expensive that it's worth it for us to put away the OPEX and invest in the CAPEX of the robotics, particularly as the cost of robotics goes down. And where a Foxconn can play a Walmart-like role informing new product development. So, 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 similar, so certainly there are cultural and historical things that are driving this, but the increased wages in historically low-cost centers of manufacturing, uh, the, in, the increased wages there is, I think, playing an even more important role. Mm -hmm. So on your genomics thing, the question that came to mind was uh, uh, you emphasize that it's going to benefit primarily the, the wealthy because yeah. they can pay for it. And I think that's, that's a correct analysis. I'm wondering whether it's in some sense special, or is it the same as what we've seen with other phenomena? The first cars were for the wealthy. Mm -hmm. The first plane rides were for the wealthy. You know, now the plane is like a bus. Everybody does it, right? Yep. But, but you know, is, so is this just a stage that's natural, like with every 
everything else, or is it something that's somehow more pronounced, more long-lasting, uh, different? So yes, but. So yes, I think that, that the commercialization of genomics will reach the middle class uh, in the same way in which air travel and personal ownership of automobiles did. But if you actually think about it, it, for both automobiles and air travel, it was decades, you know? So, mm -hmm. so air travel did not become something for the middle class to do without thinking twice until the 1970s. Right. Right. That's decades after the commercialization of air travel. Similarly, owning an automobile really became a mass phenomenon for the middle class in the United States in the 1950s. So, Sure, the, uh, sure the, the commercialization of genomics will reach broader segments of society. The question is, how long will the gap be between uh, it serving wealthier households and middle-income households? One of the, another one of the data points that's absolutely frightened me is that the actual life expectancies of the working class in the United States are actually going down. Uh, if you can believe such a thing. I mean, that's that's another thing that, you know, I read it in the McAfee and, and Brunjelson book and was just thrown backwards by it. And what, I, what worries me is that I think economic well-being is increasingly an indicator of life expectancy. And I think that genomics, while we ought not, um, you know, condemn the wealthy for using health data to better inform their health care and their lifestyles, you know, I do think that at least for the first five to ten years of its commercialization, what that will do is it will continue to the increased slope in the graph that shows a distinction between those who are wealthier and those who are less wealthy in terms of life expectancy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the uh, cryptocurrencies, I think it's very interesting yeah, what you've provided both in, as information and in terms of the arguments. To what extent is the demand argument that you've made uh, one of... Um, Diversification, that there is something new here, and as you said, sort of what falls off the truck uh, is yeah. enough. And if you add to it the fact that people are feeling there is more uncertainty, risk inherently in this global world, then um, this is a perfect thing to diversify into, even if it has all sorts of unpredictable aspects. So I don't think people know what Bitcoin is right now. I, I think th I think there is, there's a presumption that it is one of four things, and I don't know which of the four it is yet. Okay. It's something for stored value, you know, something where in the way in which you diversify between equities and currencies, it's just another form of stored value. And a friend of mine who is, you know, has a net worth of over $5 billion and who is one of the smartest people I know, views Bitcoin as just another, as, as another form of stored value. Um, and it was striking to me to hear him describe that. Category two, a speculative asset. Is it a high risk asset that moves quickly up and down? And if you ride it the right way, you make money. If you ride it the wrong way, you lose money. Three, is it a Ponzi scheme? Uh, Nouriel Rubini and other people who I also respect say, you know what, there is absolutely nothing here. So a lot of classic economists from Rubini to Krugman to uh, Larry Summers hasn't gotten this far, but he's sort of nibbled at the edges of this. But uh, Alan Greenspan certainly has said there's absolutely no value here. Um, so a lot of sort of the classic economists have said it's a Ponzi scheme. And then there's a fourth school of thought, which is that what Bitcoin actually is is a protocol, meaning don't think of it as a currency, but think of it as a public ledger system that creates trust in transactions that previously would have been very difficult. And think about it as an instrument for things like smart contracts and other such things. So as a way of, of bringing a level of transparency and authentication to contracts and other such things. Um, so for example, if you are buying a, uh, if you are buying a ticket to a Golden State Warriors basketball game right now, one of the owners is a Bitcoin enthusiast, you can use the Bitcoin protocol as a way of getting your tickets. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those four things, stored value, speculative asset, Ponzi scheme, or protocol. I don't know which one it is.
<laughs> Maybe a combination of all. Yeah. You mentioned Zambia as not being a likely uh, candidate for where it would work, but that reminded me of the phenomenal thing of in Kenya of the use of phones, yep. right? It hasn't spread really fast, a little bit in Tanzania and elsewhere. Um, could um, Bitcoin, in fact, become a, uh, something like the mobile telephony has become in uh, the so, African economy? So I don't think it would be Bitcoin. But what I do believe is that sub-Saharan African countries are the perfect places for an electronic currency. Why? Because oftentimes their own currencies are weak. They would prefer to have something that has ties to a harder or something that's easier to convert into a euro, a pound, or a dollar. Um, so I actually think that sub-Saharan Africa is a perfect place for an electronic currency. I question, though, whether it's Bitcoin. Right. No, I, I yeah, so I question in part why it's Bitcoin, because even though, you know, Mark Andreessen, who is a brilliant venture capitalist, he, he invented the web browser um, and was the CEO of a couple companies, a big point he made, he would disagree with me if he were sitting here. And he would say, well, Bitcoin has infinite divisibility. You can trade, you know, right now to, I think it's either seven or nine decimal points to the right of Bitcoin. And say, you know what, actually Bitcoin is perfect for Africa because of infinite divisibility. I take uh, perhaps a more simple man's view of this, which is that nobody's going to engage in a transaction where they're trading in one millionth or one billionth of any unit of anything. Um, so this is a case where I think that, where, where I think that behavioral economics uh, supersede mathematics and computer science. So I'm, I'm wildly optimistic about electronic payments uh, in Africa, and I think that it could be a very fertile place for an electronic currency. I just question whether it's Bitcoin. The uh, insight as to how many decimal points you have could be interesting in hyperinflations or hyperdeflations, yep. Yep. right? Because then you would want to go way in that direction. That's but right. that's extreme, I agree. So the last one before we open it up, uh, entrepreneurship. Obviously, everybody's thinking about it. Everybody here is an entrepreneur, at least at heart. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Probably so not everybody should right. be an entrepreneur. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, but you know, if... Um, uh, some uh, hardened Europeans who wanted to defend Europe looked at your diagram, let's say the Germans would say, but you know, nobody has the uh, setup of uh, medium-sized companies that we do, and boy, do we do wonders, don't we? Yep. How is that as an alternative to small entrepreneurs, most of whom go under anyway, and, uh, which is true, first year, mm -hmm. and uh, here you have this you know, really powerful engine of uh, middle-class, mid-sized companies yeah. that have proved decade after decade of being an important engine of growth. So the, the point that I would make, which I've made in the past, is that Germany is one of, I think, 28 EU countries. Mm -hmm. And while Germany has succeeded in uh, basically being able to create value within its historic manufacturing and other sectors, in a way that sustains that economy, for most of the rest of the other 27, it's not working out very well. But they would say Silicon Valley is not Louisiana. I, I, I agree. And what I would say is that entrepreneurship is not necessarily just Silicon Valley. Right, right. Exactly. I would yeah. point, you know, 40, going back to the one data point, 40% of America's GDP comes from companies that didn't exist 35 years ago. 40% of our GDP is not coming from a 90 square mile orbit right. Right. around Palo Alto. So, you know, the Silicon Valley argument, I think, is overmade by too many. You know, the problem is, you know, I don't care whether you're making a pair of shoes or whether you're making a microprocessor. You know, what I think is necessarily, what is necessary is to have an environment that lends itself to the allocation of risk capital mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship. Right. And, and, and the challenge I have right now is that my phone rings and my email is filled up with the smartest young Europeans who I know who are trying to, and who can be very patriotic, Italians or French or this or that, who are saying, hey, I'm ready to move to the United States and set up my company in Massachusetts. Or, right, no, yeah. I, I happen yeah. to agree with you, so yeah. I was playing the devil's advocate yeah. more. Yeah. But there are flows no. both directions, okay? The flow is dominant going this direction, but it is important to recognize there is a flow going in the other direction, and you there gave is. the example where FDA constraints are too yep. strong, uh, commercialization of genomics maybe in Europe. 
Yeah, no, that's right. So what what I see right now is a lot, you know, and I saw this with an, an Israeli company, which is doing fascinating, basically big data for being able to determine colorectal cancer during an earlier stage. And this is sounds obscure, but it's actually a big deal. Mm -hmm. And they, they, their strategy, they basically have an 18 month long strategy for the FDA during which they will spend tens of millions of dollars. And they basically have a couple meetings in the UK. Yeah. Um, so it's a very different landscape. And in there, it's much, there, it's, it's frictionless in the UK relative to the USA in this regard. All right, well, on that note, let's invite everybody to participate. Uh, we have a microphone here in the middle, so you can just uh, step up to it, identify yourself just briefly, and uh, be brief so that everybody gets a chance. Hi, um, it was a great talk. Thank I'm you. interested in, Alec, what you think about the uh, theft slash disappearance of all that cyber currency from Mt. Gox and yep. other exchanges. How serious an obstacle will that present to the development of this trend? I think it's a, I think it's a huge problem. Now, Mark Andreessen, who I referenced earlier, said Mt. Gox needed to be destroyed in order for Bitcoin to succeed. Um, but what, here's, my, here's the big argument that I have with people who take sort of a religious view of Bitcoin. I say, you know, if what you have is a distributed ledger, ledger system, which brings sort of hyper-transparency and hyper-trust to every economic transaction, then how is it possible that a couple hundred million dollars worth of this currency just goes missing? And so I think that, I, I think it's highly problematic. And part of it is that the wallets and other such things, the enabling technologies that allow for uh, Bitcoin to be transferred and other such things are, are underdeveloped. And so a lot of venture capital is going into them now. But I think that I think that it creates enormous problems, and I think that it creates problems too. In that, I think that it it makes the case for necessary regulation. You know, we would never allow for a bank uh, to open up on you know Amsterdam and one seventeenth, and you know somebody shows up at the bank and they say, "Oh, bad news! All of our money got stolen. Sorry." You know, there would have a there would be a series of repercussions. Uh, from a law enforcement perspective, from a regulatory perspective, there are systems in place to keep that from happening. There are not systems to keep that from happening. I could start a Bitcoin exchange or a Bitcoin wallet tomorrow. And if I have a good marketing plan, then I'd probably get a lot of stored Bitcoin or other such things. But there's no, there are no rules or regulations that there's no insurance schemes or other such things that ensure that I will provide that which I said I was going to provide. And the world's largest Bitcoin exchange basically failed at that. So I think until those problems are solved, I would be very wary of putting any percentage of my net worth into these currencies. Um, hi, my name is Zingi. I'm from the New School, the, the Department of International Affairs. And uh, my question really is, is interesting, focused on this idea of genomics and and you made a very interesting co uh, comparison with uh, with when the car first cars came out and all of that I, I come from South Africa and I have lived through a period where specifically with HIV and AIDS for a while in South Africa was a period where there was treatment but if you had money you had access to the treatment if you didn't have money you will die so in, in sort of taking into consideration the the future you've paid it out in this in this particular category, are there things that we as ordinary people can push our, our politicians to fight for or to do to counteract or to sort of minimize the most bleak outcome that you have sort of painted so that it isn't mm -hmm. a case of, well, if you have money, you have access to the kind of information that will save your life, and if you don't, tough. Yeah, I mean, so first of all, this is very tough because there are laws of supply and demand that are a function of our living in a capitalist economy where, you know, we are not going to attach price controls on things. So, and we are not going to tell a company, thou shalt set your price for, at, you know, X minus 70% and for people who means test 
a certain way. We aren't French. Um, so if anybody's going to do this, move to France and they'll do it. Um, what I think, what I, but the one thing that I think, but to be more optimistic, I mean, there can be conditionality imposed on anything that involves taxpayer dollars, okay? So what I mean by that is it continues to be the case today that hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of taxpayer dollars go into research programs at the NIH, at the National Genomics Institute, and elsewhere, um, and, the, and the purpose of which is to create a public good. So if I were to be an advocate in this case, what I would do is I would push for conditionality on the commercialization of anything created, of any of the patents or any of the creations that came out of federally subsidized research. Now, that would make it less attractive to a Pfizer or others to come in and put in the risk capital ca to capitalize it. But, you know, if you, wanted to if you wanted to index towards social justice versus, say, speed to market, then that is the advocacy I would take. That's the tactic I would use. Alan Young. Uh, over the past several decades, um, because of globalization, automation, and so on, uh, <clears throat> there has been uh, a real question about the, the, the uh, ability of uh, capitalist economies to generate jobs. Um, and what you're suggesting in terms of robotics and um, and uh, digitization suggests that in the next couple of decades, there'll be even greater pressures uh, because <laughs> more and more people will be displaced. Don't you think that politically this is an untenable situation and might it not be the case that uh, there'll be terrible political pressures to limit the, the use of robotics and limit the use of, of, of digitization in order to generate more jobs? You know, this is a field where I'd ask Jan to speak up as well because he knows this far better than I. But what I, one thing I would do is I'd go back to the premise of your question, which is when you talked about what globalization has done. What globalization has done is while it has made it more difficult in certain respects, where I grew up in, in West Virginia or in Pittsburgh or in the Rust Belt or, you know, parts of the parts of much of America, it's also created a whole heck of a lot more jobs and a lot more economic well-being in the 195 countries that aren't the United States. So if you look at the growth from poverty to the middle class, for example, in Brazil, 30 million in the last eight years. If you look at the mobility into the working and middle classes in China and India and other such things, what we've actually seen is that the product of globalization has been an enormous amount of poverty alleviation and increased employment around the world. What it's, just, what it's made tougher is life in towns like the one I grew up in in Charleston, West Virginia. Yeah, maybe so, but right. we still have national legislatures Right. And the American, uh, American legislature, I mean, right. the Congress and so on, will feel t terrible pressures. They already are feeling terrible pressures, which is one of the reasons, for example, Paul was talking about the 1% and the 99%. Right. So let, me get, so let me just make that point first so you understand globally what globalization has actually done is it's actually produced an enormous amount of economic well-being and an enormous amount of jobs. It just hasn't all been in Western Europe and the United States. Now, the pressures that you speak to, and again, I, I do really want to hear from Jan on this because he's so smart on this is it creates, it, it, what this basically does is it, it, it strengthens both the far right and the far left politically. So on the far left, you saw the Occupy Wall Street movement and other such things. But on the far right, oftentimes what it does is it, it creates environments that lend themselves to increased levels of nationalization, anti-immigration policies, and other such things. So what it does do is it creates more political ferment but, what that, but that political ferment hasn't boiled over yet. Now, it might if structural unemployment continues to grow, if this gets beyond being something that really throttles back the well-being of 10 to 15 percent and goes north of 20 percent, then I think you've got a much more significant political as well as economic phenomenon on your hands. But I'd love to hear no, from you on this. I, I agree with that. I think if you look at the various economies, uh, the rapidly growing economies have greatly benefited from this. Uh, the U.S. economy until the Great Recession, until the financial crisis, was actually creating enough yeah. new jobs uh, that it could claim that, yes, there's dislocation, you have to move workers and do adjustment from one sector to another. 
but companies like GE were you know, advertising openly, saying, look, for every five or so jobs we create overseas, we create one here. So we actually are creating jobs here as well due to globalization. Europe is the one that really is the continent that has not been for a long time creating enough jobs and has high unemployment. And, you know, in fact, uh, the Le Pen uh, victory in France in the municipal elections last weekend was uh, mm -hmm. in part the populistic, uh, nationalistic fervor in terms of anti-immigration, exporting jobs, and so on and so forth. So I wouldn't un underestimate it, but it's really mm -hmm. a question of how well the traditional capitalist market-type economy can reallocate resources. And the important thing is the uh, there, is, there are two effects. One is the substitution effect, where you substitute, let's say, robots for workers. But if you reduce costs substantially as a result, there is a positive output effect, scale effect, which means you want more of all inputs, including labor. Right? And that's where the US economy traditionally and the fast-growing economies have been good at it, and others, Europe being the prototype, just, just not. L let me just add one last thing to this, which is the last chapter of my book, which I have not written yet, um, it's forthcoming. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about parenting. And the reason for it, you know, I've got, a, I've got an 11-year-old boy, a 9-year-old girl, and a 7-year-old boy. And the reason for that is there's 300 pages of sort of economic and technological doctrine that precedes it, right? But then the last chapter is all about, all right, well, Mr. Ross, given th your 300 pages of economic and technological doctrine, what does this mean for my kids? And so then, without professing to be omniscient, what I do is I sort of take the voices and perspectives of the sort of the cast of characters from the previous 300 pages, and they talk about the kinds of skills and attributes that people will need to be able to compete and succeed in a changing economy. And so, let's see if I get that right. But at the core of your question is, is, is the last chapter of the book, really. It's about what does it mean for today's young people who will be entering a workforce where the robots of the, 19, the cartoons and movies of the 1970s are the reality of the 2020s. Uh, Ulla Dubgaard from the Danish Consulate. Uh, I work with public diplomacy, communications, and especially digital diplomacy, and I also work closely with the Digital Diplomacy mm -hmm. Coalition in DC, um, and read with great interest your thoughts on 21st century statecraft, and especially inspired by the whole concept of smart power, also in opposition to soft power. Yes. Um, so I guess my broad question is, if you were to update those ideas today with the developments we've seen the past couple of years, could you say maybe broadly how you do that? And the more specific question, how would you approach a situation such as the one we're seeing in Europe right now um, using smart power? So when you say the situation in Europe, there's so many well, situations. Yeah. <laughs> which which <laughs> one are you Ukraine, speaking? Um, yeah. Ukraine, Russia. It's a, it's a okay, so let me segregate those two things out. So first of all, how would I modernize 21st century statecraft? Um, you know, I think that there, I think one of the most important things is, uh, this is gonna sound it's sort of foreign policy wonkery, but the definition of authorities. So much of that which has been domiciled uh, within the intelligence community and classified as covert and therefore executed by the CIA or whomever the respective services of a foreign intelligence service, I think that that for a period of many years took over the work that historically would have been the work of diplomats. So the relative power and importance of work that was covert became far greater and of greater consequence than work that was overt. And what I think we need to do is increasingly, I think we need to narrow the definition of authorities for the black world, for, the, for, the, for covert operations and domicile that increasingly within the innovation arms of the white world, of the, of the traditional foreign ministries and diplomatic corps. So that's one thing. I mean, that's just sort of hard politics. It's, it's not just public diplomacy, but you know, how do you get the architecture right between defense, intelligence, and diplomacy? And I think that Hillary Clinton did a great job working collaboratively uh, with the defense and intelligence ministries uh, but what I think we need to continue to see is a reapportioning of the span of control and power uh, between the three. And within and I think that a lot of the reapportioning of that would go to 21st century statecraft. You know, a lot of the work that my team did when I was at the State Department, whether it was restoring communications to rebel-held territory in eastern Libya, whether it was, you know, stopping the political assassinations that were taking place 
in Damascus by virtue of Syriatel being able to geolocate people through the GPS on their mobile phones. People might have historically thought of those as CIA operations in the past, but I think that with the benefit of some analysis, you should say, no, these are, these are necessarily overt and not covert. They should be benefiting the masses, not just selected elites. So what I would like to see is 21st century statecraft and digital diplomacy doing a smaller, a smaller percentage of its work being just focused on public diplomacy and communications, and more of it focused on uh, what would traditionally be considered almost kinetic activity. In terms of what I would do in Ukraine, um, you know, I've written some about this. I think that you know, we've just got to make life hell for Vladimir Putin. Um, we have to, you know, he is a bully. He is a, to he is Tony Soprano. Um, he is a Tony Soprano head of state. He's a thug. That's all he is. Um, and so we need to isolate him and isolate him from his friends, the people who he thinks are his friends today inside Russia. Uh, $70 billion worth of outflows of rubles uh, to non-ruble-based currencies in the first three months of 2014 shows that you know, there are real consequences inside Russia for, for Putin's Tony Soprano-like uh, foreign policy. We need to just continue to make this worse for him. And I think this is really, what's sad about this is I really think this is about a person and not about a country. I don't think Ukraine has a problem with Russia. I don't think the United States has a problem with Russia. This is about Putin. This is a guy. This is a guy with, you know, 10 or 12 knuckle-dragging guys around him who I've spent plenty of time with, and this is exactly what they are. This is a problem with between 10 and 15 people. And yes, there are vast numbers of people around them sort of cheerleading from the sideline, but this is really a problem with a guy named Vladimir Putin and his most loyal associates. And so the appropriate response from the United States and from Europe and elsewhere needs to be to the maximum extent possible to isolate the problem to him, make his life hell, and make life hell for his friends. Hi, Henry Ma with NYU. You had talked about globalization and inequality, but I'd like to bring it back to technology. Um, Brini Olson points out that the second machine age could potentially lead to permanent displacement of humans. And uh, Martin Wolf pointed out that, especially with the tighter protection of intellectual property, these new, that the surplus from these new technologies could increasingly be captured by the patent holders rather than disseminated. What are your views on this, on the impact of these on income inequality, and also during the transition to 20th century capitalism, ameliorative policies included social safety nets, labor laws, and so on. What do you imagine could be done to ease this transition? Yeah, so first let me go to the, I, the issue of patent law and sort of IP protection. And the, the real difficulty is we have an industrial age, we have industrial, industrial age patent law that we are trying to overlay on top of an increasingly knowledge-based digital system. And so what I think that we, I think we need to modernize our IP laws in the United States to move from an industrial model to a knowledge-based model. Now that seems very easy. I said, oh, that's a good suggestion, right? Snap your fingers and it's done. No. The problem is that there are such very powerful stakeholders, uh, you know, whether it is Hollywood versus Silicon Valley, whether it's Big Pharma versus the... And I think what we are going to have to do is instead of creating a uniform patenting system uh, that applies relatively uniformly across industries, I think what we're going to have to do is increasingly disaggregate how we do patent, uh, increasingly disaggregate how we do patent regulations. So I think that, you know, the processes and the protocols and the teams and other such things built up around these need to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, to account for the fact that how you, how you protect the intellectual property of, of Big Pharma is different than how you protect the intellectual property of Silicon Valley, which is different than how you protect it from, from uh, the content creators in Southern California. So I think that there's an enormous amount of work that needs to be done fundamentally re-examining and rebuilding our IP law in the United States. Um, and while IP law has helped build wealth 
reasonably and, and, and considerably inside the United States, the question has to be, how can we allow for the, the holders of, I'm gonna get the expression wrong, the holders of capital, the owners of the, the, owners of the IP um, to be as broad as, as broad as appropriate in the creation process. Um, in terms of permanently displaced uh, workers, you're right. I mean, I, I have not yet seen modeling that suggests that we'll ever have full employment and that the structural levels of unemployment will only continue to grow. I think it's to the credit of American business and of this administration that I think the last data was we were under 7%. Um, I was surprised that we got under 7% because I do see that there is going to be an increasingly high minimum level of structural unemployment in the United States. So while I'm very excited about innovation, firm creation, entrepreneurship, digitization, and other such things, I do think that life is fundamentally going to be more difficult uh, for isolated and unskilled or underskilled workers at an ever-growing percentage. You know, when I go home to West Virginia, um, you know, it's hard to not be depressed. You know, the day I was born, my state had a population of 2.1 million. Today, it's 1.7 million. The city I was born in had 80,000 people. Today, it has 55,000 people. And they just, they got everything wrong in terms of pivoting to a 21st century economy. And I think that that isn't going to just be gone with the wave of a wand. And I think that there are going to be more cases like West Virginia where you do see vast swaths of people who are disenfranchised and the rate of inequality, the spread, uh, the, the uh, growing ever wider. By the way, just uh, a note here. Yeah. Uh, the difference between what you see in West Virginia yeah. and what you would see in the stereotypical uh, European yeah. setting would be that most of those people would still be in West Virginia unemployed. <laughs> here, in fact, the mobility has enabled to alleviate a serious problem to somewhat less, but still a problem, but less, less serious. Your pessimistic uh, view, however, is supported in the sense that the lower unemployment rate is significantly at the expense of discouraged workers, so that we have a lot of people who are not looking for jobs, but not having jobs. So if you looked at a statistic which would be more telling, employment rate, number of employed relative to the population of, you know, in the age bracket that people work in, that has decreased. It's relatively low. Yeah, please. Benjamin Ersing from NYU. Uh, just a follow-up question on your kind of digitization and change in the workforce. Do you mind speaking to what you're working on in the last chapter? As a young millennial just starting my career, it'd be very interesting to hear what your thoughts are in terms of where I should be allocating energies for what skill sets myself and, frankly, everyone should mm -hmm. be developing. So yeah. thank you. So I think, I think there's a lot of it. You know, what's interesting is when... When, my, when the generation of my grandparents went to work, uh, they, they, my grandfather would have worked with one employer in one industry. You know, one employer, 30 years, one industry. Then, in my parents' generation, it would have been one industry, maybe a couple employers. For my generation, it's, well, maybe two industries, lots of different employers. For your generation, for millennials, what it's increasingly going to be is your, your career is going to be less rooted in number of industry, number of jobs, and it's going to be what are your skills. And your skills could then, over the course of a 40-year career, put you in half a dozen different industries and in 10 different jobs. So before people self-identified with industries, and in the future, I think that I think that your generation is going is going to self-identify and self-determine with skills. You see what I'm saying? Now, the kinds of skills and attributes that I think you're going to need to succeed are recognizing that we live in an increasingly global economy. You're going to have to be fluent, literally and figuratively, so that you're as e at, as at ease doing business in Berlin, Dubai, Cape Town, Sao Paulo, and Jakarta as you are doing so locally and regionally. You know, before the great American titans, you know, we, they would have had, you know, the Codex in Rochester, New York. And they sort of ran Rochester, New York. And every sort of medium-sized American city 
had their big family. And then the big cities like New York had five, six, or seven of these families. Now what we increasingly see is that instead of this kind of spread of those who do best, we increasingly see sort of 12 to 20 nodes globally um, of very of where the sort of the global influencers congregate. And then the Pittsburghs and the Rochesters and, and these other, you know, call them second tier cities, they tend not to be second tier economically. I'm from one of them, so I, would, I don't mean that spiritually. But they tend not to be headquarter cities anymore. They tend to be sort of local outposts, or they tend to be manufacturing centers or other such things. So if you have grand ambitions, um, then one of, the, you know, one of the things that I'll most immediately point to is you have to be able to work as easily in Jakarta, Sao Paulo, Cape Town, Dubai, and Berlin as you do in whatever town you grew up in. So there's one piece of advice. Beyond that, you have to buy the book. <laughs> Hello, I'm Diane from Barnard across the street. One thing you spoke about was particularly entrepreneurship and how that is going to be what, what's going to power economic growth. Um, and I was wondering in what way can countries, will they be able to develop entrepreneurship in their countries and particularly developing countries when they're still struggling with you know, political problems? It's a great question. Um, you know, I think, it, I think the answer to that is going to vary on a country by country basis. So I think that there are certain countries where I think the governments are a disaster, uh, but where I think that for whatever sets of reasons that it actually lends itself to innovation and entrepreneurship. There are other cases where there's a relatively stable government where it would really be a hard place to be an entrepreneur. So I would really want to sort of segregate on a country by country basis. Um, let me see if I can give a couple examples of countries where I think there's a little bit of political instability, but where I'm actually more optimistic about innovation. Uh, frankly, a lot of Eastern Europe. Um, a lot of Eastern Europe, because of the very hard technical and scientific skills, you know, there might be political ebbs and flows, but the scientific and technological skill holds strong. And so I'm more optimistic there. Uh, but in places where the kleptocracy and bad governance make entrepreneurship something near impossible, then you know one has to leave. You know, I recently wrote an essay for CNN about this. In the, sa in the same week that um, WhatsApp sold for $19 billion, it was f it, it, WhatsApp was founded by a Ukrainian-American named Jan Kum. And Jan Kum was born in a village outside of Kiev in Ukraine, OK? He emigrated to the United States, sold that company for $19 billion, OK? Simultaneous to this, the short-term debt obligations coming due and the energy bills that had basically made Ukraine insolvent were exactly $19 billion. And so what was fascinating to me was to see the parallel of this young Ukrainian who had to leave Ukraine because of the kleptocracy and bad governance in his home country create a market good that was valued at $19 billion, and the entire solvency of the Ukrainian public, public bill of goods was actually equal to that $19 billion. So there are places where I'm optimistic about it, but there are other places where bluntly, I think, until they, until they get their it's really the rule of law. More important than a functional government is a functional law enforcement system. Um, you know, there can be places that have lousy governments, but if there's a rel relatively transparent and accountable rule of law, then you can make it as an entrepreneur. I think maybe that's probably the better distinction in my mind. Hi, I'm Claudio Felix. I, I work for Deloitte here in New York, and um, I actually graduated from from size in an institution like this one. And um, increasingly, just following up on the question that gentleman had in your answer that I wholeheartedly believe in due to globalization and other factors, but increasingly I'm being challenged as to the value that um, training institutions like this one beyond the public administration or the foreign service provides in terms of being able to place people in certain employment opportunities that have, in effect, we might be educating our students out of a 
out of a job because the world is international, the world is global. If you were to look at China and saying you have to speak that country, you have to speak the, their culture, they all speak English now. It's a little, we're, we're too late, right? My kids aren't, I'm not gonna tell my kids to learn Chinese because they all speak English, so it, it doesn't matter. Um, so, <clears throat> quite the point of the question is, um, in, in those discussions, we all seem to veer towards entrepreneurship and seeing maybe that's a place where we could be job creators and not be job seekers. And so um, my question is, where do you see the value that um, graduates from this institution and, and the one that I graduated from could add to um, the entrepreneurial mm -hmm. sector, let's say, um, and what can institutions such as this do to promote that, that kind of spirit? That's a great question. I mean, I'll, I'll give you just a very real world example, which is I sit on the board of directors or board of advisors for six different companies or funds right now, <laughs> job creators. And, you know, I increasingly push them uh, to hire people from, like yourself who got a degree from SICE or graduates of schools like SEPA because what I actually believe is that while these young folks who might be really good engineers and might be really good at creating a product are not necessarily at good at, as good at is helping to globalize that product. Um, so, you know, dealing with the neo-mercantilism in Brazil, you know, I don't want some 24-year-old who got an engineering degree to go do that. I'd much rather have you do that and figure that out. So I think it's really about matching the interests and aptitudes that, gra that graduates of an institution like SEPA have with fast-growing uh, firms working in the marketplace. And from my perspective, a lot of that is rooted in business development and other such things. You know, when I was at the State Department, you know, a big tension for very promising 30-somethings was they were all getting great job offers, offering them a lot more money than they were making in public service because all of these, you know, weren't just tech companies, but there's also oil companies and others, saw the attributes that these people in their 30s had and knew, hey, if, we've, if we really want to own this 1.2 billion marketplace, 1.2 billion person marketplace called India, it sure would help for us to have somebody who knows how to walk around India. And oh, by the way, you know, does actually speak the local language because if they speak English, you know, they're gonna be all the more effective creating an effective marketplace if they do speak the language that their interlocutor speaks. So I would be, I would actually be quite optimistic if I were you. The, the, the challenge is really, this is gonna sound terrible, but it's in marketing and packaging. It is, it is positioning yourself such that what you understand is in the parlance of these companies on whose boards I sit, uh, TAM expansion, total available market expansion. You know, you understand how to go into these countries that these 24-year-old engineers don't, and you know how to translate the value of their goods and services into societies where they are not necessarily culturally fluent. And you're also able to architect against, ar architect business develop solutions in a regulatory environment or in a complex economic environment, which fr frankly you don't learn in a computer lab. So I'm actually, this is a case where I'm actually really optimistic. It's all about sort of the bridge building that takes place between the two. Um, there's a unit that's been built up inside Google run by a young man who I worked with closely at the State Department named uh, Jared Cohen. He runs this thing called Google Ideas. And you know he's created this very powerful and effective arm of Google by basically bringing the aptitudes of traditionally trained foreign policy professionals and bringing it into an engineering-centered country, but where their ability to get more market share is increasingly rooted in their ability to address foreign policy challenges. Yeah, I'd yep. love to hear no, what you say yeah, about this I, as well. I, I, would, I would definitely agree with that. I would add that uh, um, you know, teams nowadays that will be in companies of various types and institutions definitely need people uh, with the C power size training in addition to the technical uh, people that, uh, you know, if you look at the curriculum here or the one you went through, it uh, is broad based. It teaches you the skills you need to, technical skills, uh, cause and effect, identifying what's causing what. 
But uh, you know, you look at the career paths of many people who were destined for foreign service. Many of them end up in international business because uh, business companies realize that they need people who have the broader view, can understand, can probably predict with higher accuracy whether Crimea is going to be occupied or not, right? And uh, suddenly that changes the whole view on a large part of the world and, in fact, globally and uh, division of power. So, so I think that companies more and more realize that it's indispensable. But I would also agree, and I've taught at business schools, public policy schools, you know, arts and science, that uh, how you package your, yourself is, is very important that understanding the lingo, understanding where you can tell the companies why you are needed and so on is, uh, is important. And once uh, you know, more and more people with this background are going to be inside those companies, they'll increase the understanding and involvement uh, beyond that. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, there is refreshments, and we can continue more informally in, uh, around coffee and brownies. Thank you Thank all you very, much. very much. Thank you. Thank you.